Welcome to Open Court. We call it My Generation on NBA TV. I'm Ernie Johnson. If you've seen the show, then you know this crew. Four-time NBA champion Shaquille O'Neal being forced to wear the tie in his first year with Turner Sports. Uh, Hall of Famer and Dream Teamer Charles Barkley is here. One of the all-time great clutch shooters in NBA history, Reggie Miller. The five-time All-Star and former Rookie of the Year, Chris Webber. 14 years, he's been an all-star, he's been an NBA champion, he is Steve Smith, five-time NBA champion with the Bulls and the Spurs, Steve Kerr, and two-time NBA champion, the one and only Kenny the Jet Smith. In this segment, we have some tough decisions to make. Is it gonna be Michael? Is it gonna be Larry? Is it gonna be Magic? Bird, little fake down the lane. Jordan trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a move by Jordan! Bird with the steal behind the back to Nate Archibald. Back to Bird. Right. You know, the no look pass by Magic Johnson. One of them, and Magic wants it more. Dribble behind the back. Oh, what a play! Slam dunk! This just a play. Larry Bird scores 60 points. Look at the Boston players mob him. And so you're starting out your team right now, and you have one of those three that you can pick, Kenny, and who is it going to be? Oh, pick? you go to me first. I say I would go to Charles first, but he say Allen I Iverson mean... as <laughs> <laughs> in our fantasy draft show. <laughs> but where would you go? You'd have to go with Michael. Um, one, because he's going he's gonna to have people want to watch him as well. Uh, to me, that's why it's a hard choice, because Michael was a player that everyone wanted to watch, even players. And I think but Magic and Bird may be the guys that people want to play with more than maybe Michael. So you're not saying nothing. Next. No, I said, <laughs> I said Michael, though. I'll take Michael. Because he's going, individually, he's the best individual basketball player from top to bottom. Well, defensively, that we've ever seen. it's not right. even close right. between not those three, right? right? He's by far the best defender. Without question. The interesting thing to me about the argument is that it took Michael a while to learn how to really be part of a championship team. He, he scored right away, but Larry and Magic were ready to win right away. You know, I think guys played better around those two early on, whereas it took Michael a little time. How do you make this decision? Do you look at rings now that everything is said and done in their careers? Do you look at rings? Do you look at just the the magnetism and the guy who, they got it. You know, they, they understood what this game was about, the effort level, et cetera. What's the, the, the determining factor when you say, this is the guy? See? Uh, for me, it's the fact of what you guys just brought up, who wants to play with other people on the team? And when I think of Magic Johnson, if I'm starting my team with the point guard that sat in the captain's chair and played center in every position in the game in the championship, there's no way I'm going against Magic. I have help defenders that can probably help. You know, you look at, all these guys are great, but you look at the first few years of all these guys, they all had great Hall of Famers, and maybe Mike didn't have that in the beginning, but to me, the one thing is magic, being the leader that he is. One thing that is, may, maybe it is up for question, but magic to me in the history of the game is one of the best leaders from what you've seen in his getting people energized, getting the crowd energized, the style of play. You ever notice when they scored how fast Magic Johnson got the ball up to half court? You know, those are showtime things, but you're setting up the play with 20 seconds on the clock. And just um, him getting everybody involved, knowing what buttons, buttons to push. And I don't know if anybody had his intangibles. Chuck. Uh, to me, it's Michael for two reasons. Number one, he won more championships, so I give him that. But look at who they played with. Bird played with the greatest front line ever, two other Hall of Famers. Played with Dennis Johnson, another Hall of Famer. Magic played with... Kareem, Kareem Worthy. James Ward, the two other Hall of Famers. Ba uh, Byron Scott was terrific. You know, Michael had Scott at the first time. They still won three. Next time, you know, they had another Hall of Famer in Dennis Rodman. But when he had one Hall of Famer, he won three. 
And then when he got Dennis Rodman, they won another three. And I think people forget, he retired in his prime the first time. They probably would have won two more championships. And this guy was flat out scary. He, it, it, I don't even think it's close to saying who was the greatest basketball player ever. But I think, to me, he's like the hockey of Wayne, uh, Wayne Gretzky of hockey. Like, his numbers are so much better than those other guys. Those other guys are great, don't get me wrong. But Michael, it, it just was an honor and pleasure to play against him. How about Larry Bird in this equation, though? And tell me, when you watched Larry's game, Smitty, what it was that jumped out at you that has him held in such high regard throughout the NBA? Well, I think, Ernie, like we all know, it's a tough decision with those three. Unbelievable players. But just to talk about Larry, for me to see the guy who can shoot the basketball, but then also be able to change his game up but to do whatever he had to do to win. You know, kind of like Magic, kind of like Michael, but, you know, I was impressed for a guy with his athletic ability, which is, was not a lot, to be able to rebound the basketball, to really take the fundamentals of the game and make it, take it to another level. I mean, everything fundamentally, if you watch Larry Bird, he did at a top level. I mean, but if I had to pick, because I started my team always with the center and a point guard. So nothing taking nothing away from Michael. We all know he's the greatest player, but if I'm going to start my guy with a, with, a, with a team with a point guard or a center, I have to go with Magic Johnson because now I can plug any two, three, four, five with a Magic Johnson and we'll have a chance to win. You know, Reggie, I think getting back to Michael for a second, and I didn't know this until research told me, in your rookie year, you started one game and it was against Chicago. You had 13 in the game. Michael had 38. Uh, Good defense. <laughs> yeah, what? But when you're on the floor with him, because uh, I want to get to Steve, too, on what it's like to be a teammate of him. But when you're on the floor against him, what was that all about? Well, look, grew up in the L.A. area, was raised and trained by Magic Johnson. I patterned my game after Larry Bird. But being in the Central Division and going against Steve and, and the Bulls, and I agree with Charles, no question to me, if I'm starting a team, it's Michael Jordan. Just for the simple, and Smitty can attest to this, we had to guard him, you know, 35 to 40 minutes a game. And he was the shack of shooting guards because there's no way you were going to move him off the post. He was cat quick, and on top of that, he was going to embarrass you in front of your family and friends. So having said all that, if I'm starting a franchise, not only do I want to put people in the seats, because Michael will do that, but his skill level was so far ahead of everyone else I'm going with MJ. What are the intangibles and the things you'd, that the average fan does not see? Uh, you know, you can go to a game and watch him play, but it, to be around him day in, day out, what made him different? I think just the will to win and the way that manifested itself in practice. I mean, every day was a battle. It really was. It, it, whether it was a scrimmage, shooting drill, didn't matter. He wanted to win so badly, and, and that established the entire culture for the team. I mean, he, here's the greatest, most talented player on earth who's working harder than anybody. So if that doesn't kind of establish who you are, you know, as an identity, as a team, I don't know what does. Shaq, jump in here. For me, uh, it would have to be Magic Johnson, because if you look at the traditional point guard, they have always been, not, not small, but, but smaller. You know, Magic was the first oversized guy that, that excelled at being a point guard. You know, he actually gave Chris and myself the, the, the confidence to be able to get the ball, take it off the glass, and go all the way. Uh, you, you know, Mike, best player on the planet, never really had a chance to play against Larry Bird, but I, I actually used to hate Larry Bird. I, 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 I hated him. Because, well, why? I mean, because, well, not hate him, I was sort of like, you know, jealous of him, because he was a regular guy that did everything. He shouted in your face. He had to fade away. One time, I was watching the game. They was playing somebody, and I was betting this guy. And he was falling out of bounds. And he shot that thing over the backboard, and it went. And I was like, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, I thought most of what he did was luck. But as I, you know, got older and kept watching, I, I just knew that it was skill. And, you know, for him to even have his name mentioned in this category with, with Magic and Michael Jordan just shows how great of a player he was. Yeah, I think what Michael was, the first great athlete that was the most fundamentally sound. Most great athletes, they, they don't try to be fundamentally sound. So they just jump over you, they run faster than you. But if you look at Michael, he'd have the correct hand in the passing lane. He'd have defensively, he's the only guy, he was Deion Sanders of, 
basketball well, where you wouldn't run a play on his side of the court because he was defensively could stop that side of the court. So, you know, I don't think there's any ever been anyone like him. So it's a two-part question. Who's the best player ever and maybe who you start your franchise with? Good food for thought, and it will continue with more of Open Court, my generation here on NBA TV. We played Utah two years in a row, six games, so 12 games against John Stockton. Mm. And I have the greatest respect for him. I see him away from the court, love him, great guy. But he was a dirty bastard. This is where it started. Hey, the first punch, get Charles. Up. I mean, that is that. You too little, Chuck. You too little, Chuck. Right there, oh, that? Oh, 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 <laughs> yeah. Talking about personal nemesis you may have had uh, in the NBA, Kenny, or are you just too nice a guy you got along with that? No, I, I think that my personal nemesis was actually in the NBA Finals, Derek Harper, because Derek Harper was, was a, that was the last year of hand checking, and so Derek Harper was one of those guys who could control you with his hand. But then when he got to the Knicks, when we played against Dallas, when he played with Dallas. You know, I don't think the stakes were as high at the time when I came into the league for him because I didn't, I didn't come into the league when they were going for championships. So his, his attitude was a little bit different. He was more of a nice guy. But the Knicks had the reputation of being this mean team and Patrick Ewing and Oakley and Fizz. So he changed his whole persona. Even in, before the game, he wouldn't speak to you. Like, before, we, hey, Kenny, what's up? Now it was like, yo, what's up? Yeah, you know, like... Hey, who are you right now? So, <laughs> from that, and then he was getting the best of me for six games in the NBA Finals. So I really was just sick at Derek Harper. Can you can you whittle down the list, Charles? I know we saw <laughs> we saw you hit uh, Paul McKeskey with, with your with your wristband, <laughs> and uh, well, the, and you know how much the, that hurts. The, well, the McKeskey but, thing was one of, was one of those guys who's out there trying to get you to, to, to hit him. Which you did. Work. Which I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Work. Good job. No, 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 no. Some of these guys back in the day, like Greg Kite, McKeskey, they like try to beat you down the whole game, try to make you lose your temper. You lose your temper. Lamb Beer just tried to, to knock the hell out of you. My actually, my personal nemesis is Kevin McHale, because he was such. He's the best player I ever played against. You could not stop him. I, I've always said that you could not stop that guy. It was. And on the other end, I had to use every ounce of energy I did to score on him. That guy, when I look, when I looked at, because we all look at the schedule, we're like, okay, I can have some fun that night. Uh oh, uh oh, better get a good night's sleep that night. I mean, we all say the same thing uh, about different guys, but Kevin McHale is the best player I played against because he was unstoppable offensively and he gave me nightmares on defense. I think we can probably differentiate too between guys who were your nemesis and maybe you respect their games but they were really tough to play against and then guys you just didn't care for. Um, Shaq, you want to take a stab at guys you just didn't care for <laughs> in the league? Well, I didn't care for a lot of guys, especially most of the guys on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the guy I hated playing against the most was Rick Mahorn. He had this move that was called pull the chair. See, as big guys, you know, they teach us to, you know, feel where the defender is. You can either go left, you can go right. But, you know, Rick Mahorn had a real big physical body. And, like, he had this move that he would lean on you. So as soon as you lean back, you wouldn't be there. And you fall. One game, I had him. And I already had in my mind, I'm going to spin baseline, give him the bow, hope they don't call a foul, and throw it down. But I leaned back so far, he wasn't there. I damn near went to the <laughs> third row. They <laughs> called tribal. I was like, so you got... Uh, I hated playing against Rick Moore. And sometimes, I mean, you may have an issue with guys. I remember earlier in your career, yeah, there was talk, you know, about David Robinson. You thought maybe David Robinson had... Uh, big time. Had big time. time yeah. At one point, uh, is that over and done with? Well, that now it is that I'm retired, but... <laughs> 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 if we had a game, it wouldn't be over. I just, you know, it was... You know, I had to... You know, I had to find ways to motivate myself. So when I met Dave, he was nice, but he wasn't as nice as I wanted him to be. 
So it's like Dave signs his autograph, and he kind of, come here, big fella, and he just signed some. I couldn't even read it. <laughs> I was like, okay. So if I ever see you, I'm going to get him. So you added his penmanship. <laughs> <laughs> that man made me cry in my little mom's Toyota. <laughs> I was sitting there, man, I was so mad. How about a C? Man, I, I, don't, I know the West Coast, the whole conference one year was my nemesis. When I think of it, kind of on the respect side, you say, I remember that it was from Charles in his older years to having to check all these guys in one season. Uh, these two, Kevin uh, Garnett, Rasheed Wallace, Dirk Nowitzki, and I thought we had the best power for us. And every night, you know, it was like, wow, you got to bring your A game and you got to figure it out. But older, Terry Cummins. Terry mm -hmm. Cummins is the only man to punk me in my life <laughs> <laughs> in the air. Like, uh, I came in the league a rookie, wanting to play, thinking I'm tough, and Ricky Pierce says, don't mess with Preacher Man. Like, Preacher Man? <laughs> no Preacher Man. And I give him a ball. He's like, young fella, stop. And he touched me, and I'm like, okay, you got a nice, strong grip. <laughs> <laughs> I come back downtown, down, down, and somebody else fouled me. And he catch me with one hand out the air like your grandfather would, and just told you, say, listen, young boy, I'm telling you, don't throw no bowls out here. Don't let Ricky pump you up to get in a fight. <laughs> and that was the only time I was like, if I keep playing against him, he's going to be my nemesis. We didn't keep playing, but that's the one guy through, through the league I remember that he had that old man strength and put you in a vice grip. How about it, Rich? Look, mine's out of respect. I consider myself, you know, I'm being a little braggadocious here, but I consider myself the best shooter ever. But there's one guy that tops me. Mm -hmm. And he got underneath my skin. And the reason why he got underneath my skin, because a lot of times I couldn't understand what he was saying. And it was the late, great Drazen Petrovic. Oh, yeah. This guy, when he came off screens and he started to talk to you, yeah. You couldn't understand him. <laughs> he, ne he smelled like he never Smell. took a shower. <laughs> Maybe it was something complimentary. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no. You talk about wanting to strangle someone. Yeah. Drazen Petrovic was my nemesis. I could not stand this guy, but <laughs> to this day, I respect him because I think he is the best shooter I've ever seen in my life. Better than Ray Allen. The best shooter I've ever seen in my life. And you concur, Steve? You know, I'll go with Reggie. He got on your nerves because he talked, he pushed, and you couldn't understand him. He smelled, and he made you. <laughs> he smelled. He I did. was honest. He smelled. He did. We had to guard him. He, he smelled. I, I'm going to tell you my name. <laughs> well, perhaps that was, that was playing. Oh, say that on no, the it was playing. Right. That was well, playing. My, like, my, I'm my. Playing, playing Reggie well, Miller tonight, uh, I'm not going to shower for three days. <laughs> <laughs> that was a Mine point. was, you know, I'm a big Magic fan growing in Michigan State, so I'm going to be a point guard in the NBA. Muggsy Bowl made me change my position. Picking me up 94 feet, Kenny. I mean, he turned me, turned me, he said, you're not going to play point guard for so long. <laughs> and after about a year and a half, and Muggsy kept looking at me smiling, every time we would play, he changed me from going from a, shoot, a point guard to a shooting guard. Next was Michael. And the reason why, I got to be honest, because, you know, you're trying to make an all-star game for me in the Eastern Definitely. Conference. Yes. Michael Jordan was in already, no problem. So you only got one spot for the next two guards. So now I'm, I'm mad at Michael because if he went to the Western Conference, <laughs> maybe I had a chance. But in the Eastern Conference, Michael winning championships, yep. and you got me, Reggie, Joe, Penny, Allen Houston all fight for that one spot. So yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a little mad at Michael for that. Anybody got really got under your skin? Uh, no question. Kenny touched on it earlier. You, you, you play a playoff series, and you go against a guy over and over again. It's inevitable. And we played Utah two years in a row, six games, so 12 games against John Stockton. Mm. And I have the greatest respect for him. I see him away from the court, love him, great guy. But he was a dirty bastard. <laughs> oh, whoa! Dirty, dirty, whoa! Dirty bastard. Whoa! Steve, come! Oh, I'm letting it out. I'm oh, letting it out. I'm letting it go. go. I've never seen a therapist about this. I'm gonna, this is my time. Let to it go. Let it there out. you go! Tell you feel oh, better. Oh, oh, take the couch. Yeah, <laughs> oh my! Hey, John, John was a person that would this stretch is the, the this boundaries. Is the, the PG version of what yeah, he said. Am I allowed to say was, that word on TV? Sure. Sure. You got it. You got it. On NBA TV, you are. I'll say a lot worse than Come that. Come on. No, 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 no. NBA TV, I don't. You, you can say. <laughs> you can say dirty as much as you want. It's like HBO. NBA TV is like HBO. I think that. I think that. John understood there's a there's a, 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 a personal space law and he understood how to invade that and as a guard you know when I'm talking to you Ernie I'm going to talk to you here but John 
Exactly. This is a, we, we're European. comfortable even as we speak. Playing kind of European way. A little bit closer than you said. You're shooting a jump shot. It's respect that a guy shooting a jump shot that you can't block it, so you kind of just contest. John made like he could block it, and he'd get under your feet. Or, or and I, when you're running out, the ball is out of bounds, he's running out, he'd, like this trip that he would do, and all of a sudden a guy would trip, and they'd throw the ball in at the same time, and he'd go down and lay it in. So he had a lot of those type of... Bastardly moves. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's an, another. Right back. Oh, right back. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Hey, last last thing in in this segment, Shaq. Everybody knows you and Kobe were had something going on. Is it over and done with? Is it is everything cool? Is there is there anything still there from the time? Is he still a bastard? <laughs> no, listen. Uh, when I was in charge of that organization, I was the leader. You know, I was always in CEO mode. So, you know, I wasn't really worried about the relationship. I was worried about the task. And Hersey and Blanchard states that you must worry about the task and not really worried about the uh, relationship. So, you know, the task at hand was to win championships, and that's what we did. Now, if I see him now off the court with his lovely wife, his lovely kids, hi, kids, I'm Uncle Shaq. Hello, Miss Vanessa. I mean, so, you, you know, for me, it's nothing there. Every now and then. Everything's cool till the book yeah, comes out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the great quotes of all time. <laughs> Everything's cool till the book, book comes out. Comes out. <laughs> uh, you're watching Open Court on NBA TV. I have to establish the post against him <laughs> because this guy is so physical. So I have to establish that I'm here in the game. <laughs> we run those plays, I don't touch the ball. court continuing here with my generation on NBA TV so uh, tell me what it was like you talk about in your generation a couple of big men Patrick Ewing and Akeem Olajuwon uh, the hand-to-hand -hand combat that goes in there in your first hand there what's it like Shaq? Akeem Olajuwon had everything you, you know most most all the other centers at best they got two or three moves but Akeem he was very unpredictable on the block you know you thought he was going right he would go left he thought he'd shoot a jumper, he'd come with the up and under. And, and, and mentally, he was a guy you couldn't break. Like, all the other guys I say something about in the, in the paper, especially the Georgetown boys, you know, I say something about Alonzo, Dikembe, they get mad, you know how they play, but, you know, you say something about Akeem or you throw Akeem a bow, he just look at you and go, nice move, big fella. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, I met with him in the uh, finals, what, 94, 95? Right. And he just... You know, he was the first guy to actually embarrass me because I really didn't know what he was going to do. You know, you watch his tape and, you know, he faces up, he shoots the jumper, but when you're there, if that double ain't, ain't, ain't coming, he will score. He will score on you. And on the other side, how about Patrick? Patrick was, Patrick was mean. Patrick was mean. And, you know, all the Georgetown guys were mean. And, you know, coming up, I, you know, tried to pattern my game after Patrick. And, you know, Patrick was a great player, but uh, if you ask me the better of the two, I'm going to have to go with Akeem Olajuwon. Kenny, I would think that there's no question. Patrick Ewing. Above... <laughs> <Yes. laughs> As we've seen from the photos already, that, uh, that, that Akeem would be your pick. I, it just, I never played 
I, I've never played against, never played with anyone that was that unique. Uh, because you defensively, forget the, uh, the dream shape, but defensively, if there was a pick and roll and they, you switched, he can guard a guard. He was able to move his feet and be able to be in position and guard a guard. Then, because his rule was, he said, Kenny, I'll play your man for five seconds. Just hold up the big guy, and then when he starts to shoot, I'll contest it and get back to mine. I'm like, you're going to do all of that? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Like, how can you do all that? He really thought he could do it, and he actually did. So to me, without by, not even close in terms of what he brought to the table, just totally. Patrick is a great warrior, great competitor, and he was probably... He probably played with the least amount of talent than any great Hall of Famer probably that you could mention in terms of, I don't think he ever played with another Hall of Famer. So he's the guy that maybe didn't have that talent around him maybe, that, but he's not Akeem. What was Akeem like off the floor? The most honorable guy I ever met. Like, that, that's a hard, you know, most people, oh, he's a nice guy, but honorable. Like, he, he just said what he was going to do, and he did it. And he didn't, you know, I'm going to be there at 3, I'm going to pick you up. Like, if I'm on the highway, hey, I need a ride. Oh, I'll be there in 15 minutes. 15 minutes, he's going to be there. Like, he was that type of person. Hakeem Olajuwon or Patrick Ewing? Well, first of all, I think Patrick Ewing is probably the most underrated of all the great centers because he didn't win the championship. Uh, but I will say this about him. He, that guy, he's a man. Yeah, he's, and he's a teddy bear. But I'm going to go with Olajuwon because... I'm going to pick it back on something Kenneth said. I've said it, sports is a unique group of people. Uh, it's a lot of good stuff and bad stuff that goes on in sports. Hakeem Olajuwon is an honorable person. And I've only said that about a couple guys in my whole N NBA venture. A any of us here? No, nah, not quite. Y'all are all, y all, y all wow. are good guys, but Akeem, <laughs> Kenny started now. Uh, he's, Kenny is honorable. I Thank mean, you. I mean, Kenny said Akeem is honorable. Oh, yeah, Kenny no, said no, Akeem is honorable, yeah. not that you're honorable. Right. But, I was, great. but you know the thing that amazed me about Akeem Olajuwon is, first of all, he's so good he changed his name. He used to be Akeem, but he was so good he changed it to Akeem. <laughs> or something in that what? neighborhood. Hakeem, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, he was Hakeem and he changed it to Hakeem. But if you were to say, yeah, let's make him take that shot. The shots he take, like if you're a good defensive coach, you say, yeah, let's make him take that 360 fadeaway, half, half his head behind the backboard. Like, that's the shots he shoot. Like, we played them in two memorable seven-game series and I'm sitting there looking at tape, and I'm like, homeboy just did a 360. Half his head is behind the backboard. The only thing on the outside of the backboard on, on the court is the ball. The rest of them, he's, I don't even know if he can see the rim. But it's the most amazing thing, the shots he takes. And, you know, see, when we were watching that video coming into the segment, uh, when they show that dream shake against David Robinson, mm. which is the one that, I mean, you guys, everybody's shaking their head, and everybody goes, woo, -hoo! and I mean... What do you, when you see a big man with those, with those kind of moves and that fluid, what did you think? I think about two things. I think, one, the fact that he made that move because you thought he was going to do the jump hook. Because he can hit you with a basic move. He has basic moves. So you have to be really good, basically, first to add everything else. And then when he hits you with the left shoulder or right turn, you know, we, uh, the playoffs, uh, fresh uh, rookie year, you know, you get a book of what type of moves every guy like. He go 40% over shoulder. Hakeem, it was nothing but on this side, he may go left, he may go right. And he was the only guy ever in the NBA that was my height and a center that you had to move your feet when he in front of you. Akeem, Akeem just didn't have that, that uh, cro the, the um, shake on the baseline. He would get you at the free throw line, give you a little stutter step dribble, and you wouldn't know what to do as a big guy. You look in the guards, you know, for help, and Akeem wasn't that big. That's all, when I saw him, I was like, okay, he's not that big. And to be, every time he's blocking shots, elbow over the rim or the jump shots, his game to me was just, it was just so versatile. Hey, it's funny, you talk about elbows over the rim and that big. He, he said to me one time, he was like, Kenny, I'm really sorry. I'm like, why are you sorry? He said, because sometimes you set out practice and you say you have this thing called tendonitis. I'm like, yeah, you know. He said, I have it. It feels like a headache in your knee. 
This was 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> into, into, he had never had tendonitis. Right, right. He never knew what that was. <laughs> so I'm like, right. so yeah, so, dream. My name, I got, I got migraines. So, so. Right. so as, as a guard, that was the first big man that I started asking tape for, because I wanted to see his footwork. I mean, one thing, Kenny, I could say, watching him in the layup line, him handling the basketball, he has spin moves. So I'm thinking, you know, big guys, where does he get this from? But then also talking to Jim Boylan, who was the kind of assistant coach who was doing video for y'all, I was always asking him, he said, the biggest thing about Akeem was his counters. You know, everything a defensive had was his counters. So for me, trying to post up, I'm trying to learn all the counters. Unbelievable, phenomenal to try to pattern your foot, footwork as Akeem. I couldn't do it because this, this is a guy. The footwork, it seemed like it was just fluent. It was something off of feel versus everybody trying to break it down. Look, I agree with everyone here on the panel. I would go with Hakeem Olajuwon out of the two, but the guy that kept me up most nights because <laughs> he was in our conference was Patrick Ewing. And not only because he was well coached under the Riley years, but you knew what you were getting defensively when the Knicks drafted Patrick. We knew he was going to protect the basket. But I think all of us would be a little bit shocked that he has over 25,000 points because he wasn't a scorer while he was at Georgetown. And the way he evolved offensively, yeah, he's not in the category of a Shaq or a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Hakeem Olajuwon, but you talk about one of the meanest guys to protect <laughs> the paint. Patrick Ewing was that guy. And you had so many memorable nights against that team. You talked about being in the same conference, but the Pacers and the Knicks, and it was you, and it was Starks, and it was Spike, and it was Patrick Ewing. And uh, I, I imagine those matchups even ratchet up that, that meanness and that intensity even more. But not only that, I, I don't think a lot of New Yorkers give Patrick yeah. Ewing the credit yeah. that he deserves. A, a lot of times he was the, the scapegoat, and it's unfair to him because... This was one guy that brought 110% each and every night he took the floor. And yeah, he didn't win a championship, but it wasn't because of it was a lack of effort. And, I, you know, when you hear New Yorkers talk about Patrick and sometimes uh, the, the misfortune and, and not winning a championship, I scratch my head because there's a lot of us on this panel because of the great Michael Jordan didn't win a lot of championships. And he just falls into that category. I give you the final word, Steve Kerr, on this when you put these two guys together and what they both brought to the table. Well, as a guard, you have to learn defensively to, to help down and rotate. And I thought it was a lot easier to help down on Patrick. He was a little bit more mechanical offensively, so you could help and the team could kind of figure out the rotations. With Hakeem, it was impossible. I mean, as soon as you come down, he's spinning the other way. Now your rotations are a mess. That guy was unguardable down on the block. Two of the greats, Sakeem Olajuwon, Patrick Ewing, and we'll have more of Open Court, My Generation on NBA TV right after this. How did Doc help me? Doc took me shopping. <laughs> he said, son, you're a grown-ass man. <laughs> a grown man can't wear a warm-up suit to the airports all the time. Serving. When you come into the league, Doc's in your locker room. Did you approach him uh, and say, hey, I'm Charles Barkley? Did he see you and say, welcome? How did that all work? I've told this story a hundred times and I never get I must not have been listening. I never, I, I, I told the brothers. <laughs> uh, just the brothers. <laughs> Ernie, the night before training camp, I was up all night. I was nervous because it was my first training camp, obviously. But the number one thing I thought about the whole night was, how am I going to approach Dr. J? Do I call him Dr. J, Julius, Mr. Irving? I had cold sweat thinking about that. <laughs> and so I'm sitting in the locker room. Because first of all, not only that, Moses, Bobby Jones, Andrew Tony, Maurice Cheeks, like the Sixers, this was their heyday. So I was up like, God, I don't even, I'm going to see all these guys I've been watching on TV. I don't know what to do. And Doc was clearly at the forefront. And I'm sitting there, 
And finally, I, I, I'm in the locker room, and I, I said, well, I don't know what to do. And Doc comes over and says, hey, young fella, I'm Doc. And I said, I I'm Charles Barkley. Ernie, I can't explain how nervous I was. Because, like I said, that's when the Sixers was in their heyday. And seeing Doc and Moses Maurice and Bobby and all those guys, but Doc was the guy. That's, that's one thing you, I always, like, you, you, we'll all have this in common. When we're growing up as little kids, there's very few players the kids say, I'm Dr. J, I'm John Havlicek, I'm Maddie Johnson, I'm Larry Bird. We all got somebody, like, you know, who we are. And, man, Doc was the guy for most people, especially somewhere like me where we don't have NBA basketball in Alabama. But he made it so, <clears throat> but I, that's the only thing I was nervous about. How did he help you? as a rookie in the, in the NBA? Well, you know, Ernie, one of the problems in the NBA today, I think, I want to get, Moses is my mentor, Doc is my mentor, Maurice and Clement Johnson and all those guys. One of the big problems in the NBA today is, I don't think they have enough older guys on these teams. Listen, as great a player as Dwayne Wade is, LeBron James, they're like 27. <laughs> Nobody knows a lot at 27. I think that's one thing that's really hurt the NBA. I think every NBA team should have an older guy. How did Doc help me? Doc took me shopping. <laughs> he said, son, you're a grown-ass man. <laughs> a grown man can't wear a warm-up suit through the airports all the time. <laughs> and I know, you, I know that that's, that's like a, guys don't understand. Like, I'm, most guys, when we come from college, we all got warm-ups. We wear warm-ups everywhere. Like, dude, you're a professional now. He took me shopping. They bought me suits. You know, stuff like, like simple stuff like that. He said, you a grown man now. You ain't in college. When you're in college, the whole team wear warm-ups. We can't have nine guys wearing suits, and then you and Le Leon Wood getting on here <laughs> <laughs> in sweats. You know what, Ernie, you said about who would you start your franchise with, with Larry Bird, Magic, and Michael? Well, Dr. J's who you would start your league with. And he's the guy who can be an ambassador for the league, and he could be a spokesman. And his style of play was infectious. So he created all of those things that those three had. Dr. J was the first league ambassador. And in terms of being a... ABA a, to NBA. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and really being a pioneer in style of play and the whole, you know, just call it swagger, call it style, call it flash, whatever. It, he had it. And the fro, and I think that, yeah, you know, the fro really set him apart, especially in his ABA days, coming in, merging into the NBA. But look, I grew up a Laker fan, and in '83, obviously, you know, when Philly played the, the Lakers, how many of us here, seriously, after that move when he went baseline and he <laughs> held it, and how many of us went outside and tried to do that? We didn't have the big hands, but we all tried to be like Dr. J. We all tried to sail. We all tried to jump from the free throw line. I think he originally won the first slam dunk yeah. competition. Reggie, yeah. you, you mentioned the fro. How about the shoes? Yeah. Isn't he the first guy who had his own shoe? The doc, remember the Commerce Dr. J? Yeah. Right, so you, I don't think anybody else up Chuck to that Taylor. point had their own Chuck Taylor. Right. Doc was the first brand. Yeah. Right. I think when also to echo Charles, you know, because Doc lives here in Atlanta and I'm still with him, you know, being around him, I, I, you're still nervous around Doc. You know, I, I still go up to him and I say, Doc, how you doing? And he said, I'm fine, Steve. He still has that. Or oddly figurely over you. And, and like you said, Kenny, he's an ambassador of the league. I mean, Dr. J is something my dad talks about, my granddad talks about, I still talk about. I mean, I think he'll go one player like Michael, and those players will go through generations after generations. How did he impact your development as a basketball player? Well, I, I think it was just what you said, his style. I think the individuality of him on his teams is what made him. Because you always knew Dr. J played on great teams and everything, but I knew Dr. J, who he was, whether it was with the Pisces or the fish to say Pittsburgh. <laughs> and he had the same, you know, afro on. Or it was just, you know, he was always professional, it seemed like. It seemed like, you know, it was it was always his demeanor. But you knew that you knew that what he had inside it, of him, you wanted it, and maybe you had a little bit of your own in there. And if you ever got the chance to play, you were gonna do your dunks your way. You were gonna do your things your way. I mean, no one glided or even tried to have body movements like him. And so he taught me, you know, you can be your own individual. Doc was just so smooth. You know, he was smooth above the rim and below the rim. You know, he was just so cool doing it. I can remember one time at LSU, um, I missed class, and he was down there doing something for, for Converse, and Coach Brown brought him over. And when I woke up, it was a hand on my chest, and I thought it was a, 
a guy that if you miss class, you got to run laps. So I'm thinking, oh, man, I got to run these laps. And then when, then when I looked up, it was Doc. He was like, how come you didn't go to class, big fella? And he was just so smooth. And, you know, we became friends. And when I decided to leave early, after calling my parents, Doc was one of the first people who I called. He was just so smooth. He was just so nice. And he was very hospitable. That's a cool point, too, because I wonder, do you, there are certain guys you'll never forget when you met Dr. J, right? Right. Correct? Yep. Sure. I mean, it's just a, the presence. I mean, you just feel like he has the answer, whatever you want to ask. I mean, Dr. J, you know, we talk now, you know, about our kids. And, you know, everything is, he takes a little pause. And whatever he says, I mean, I'm listening like I'm a little kid again. That's what Dr. What's J. What's that, Yoda, the, the person with the beard? Who's the person, not Yoda, but the person with the <laughs> beard? And they come in and then you're going to see this great... You're going to see this great... <laughs> person to get all of the insight from. He's like that person in, the, in those the, uh, From the Matrix. In those, the, the Oracle. Or, the, or, he's the Oracle. He's the Oracle. Oh, the Oracle. He still is that guy. Like, even last year, we were doing the playoffs. And um, I remember you said this is the best part about our job. We had one of the best conversations before the game. Where we were talking about just who our favorite players were and all this. And Dr. J walk in. I've always had the biggest hands I've known. I've never met anybody with hands bigger than mine. And it was just an honor to go up to him and say, you know, let me see your hands. No, no, no. Give him the better story. I have an event, All-Star Weekend. Oh, you're going to tell him? <laughs> no, tell him. So I'm a Dr. J fan. Go ahead. Dr. J is at the event, and Chris Webber's there. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, we, it, the night is ending, and Chris is walking around with a cup. So I'm like, Chris, why are you taking the cup? This was Dr. J's cup. <laughs> he stole the cup <laughs> for the I'm event from and had him sign it. <laughs> and this is two years ago, so that's the impact. Yeah, still has, still he still hasn't poured it out. Hasn't poured it out. <laughs> I actually drink out of everything. I don't wash it. <laughs> I just got his name on it. Hey, you know, Reggie says it's part of it was the was the fro and 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 your hairdo on that photo over there. Look, I tried, a little the, bit of I tried to do here. the Dr. J no, roll a, right there. I, I, I had, a little, so had a little yeah. curl. <laughs> ESG, <laughs> the actual <laughs> is <this> fellow. <laughs> wow. I tried to have that. the doc there. Uh, <laughs> that was the best I could do. Uh, uh, there's oh Kenny, Kenny and the Czar. Oh. 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 I look like Robert Reed. Robert Reed Parker Jr. Kenny? You're watching Open Court. Uh, on NBA TV, more to come. No, it was a scene when they was getting ready to start making love on the floor. So the girlfriend pulls out some hot cheese yeah. and start melting on his chest, and he was going, ha, 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 And that cheese was burning his chest. <laughs> 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 give you your first job? That's a violation for Michigan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> That's a violation for Michigan. Another one. He did. <laughs> <laughs> and you used to go uh, work out with the pissing? <laughs> violation <laughs> for Michigan. <laughs> 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 yeah. Dr. J was in your room? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. For more open court, check us out on NBA.com and NBA TV. This is one of those questions that everybody wants to go first because <laughs> go in alphabetical order. If, 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 if you go last, go in alphabetical order. If you go last, you say, "Oh, they, he took mine." So, what is Let's the? Let's go by fewest all-star appearances. Okay, so what is <laughs> what is the one movie, Steve Kerr, that if you're flipping around and you see this movie, you, you stop what you're doing and you watch it. Doesn't, doesn't matter where it is in the movie. Shawshank Redemption. Oh, yeah. it's an easy one for me. Great movie. Great, Great movie. movie. What is it about Shawshank, Steve, that uh, strikes a chord with you? Red and Red and Andy, the friendship between those two guys, and then you know the scene at the end where they they finally end up in Mexico. Oh, 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 oh I didn't oh, you haven't see seen it. it? Oh, oh, my oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still gets me every time. <laughs> Shaq. My favorite movie is Don't Be a Menace While Drinking South Central Juice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grandma. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. no, no, listen. Small it world, was a scene, No, it was a scene when they was getting ready to start making love on the floor. So the girlfriend pulls out some hot cheese yeah. and start melting <laughs> on his chest, and he was going, ha, 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 ha. And that cheese was burning his chest. <laughs> 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 that was a lot. That was a lot making sense. Hey, that was your favorite yeah. movie, wasn't it? That was like Mountain? Remember that, Chris? <laughs> was not Remember that, Chris, and that cheese? <laughs> <laughs> wasn't as good as the book. Uh, that's your second just OK. All right, man. Somewhere in the middle, I'll go in a minute. 
give me something. Uh, <laughs> it's two, actually. Do the right thing or training day. You said give him one. You said give him one. Give him one. Now you probably should go ones over here. Okay, I would go with do the right thing. Do the right thing. Because it, it was it's it's based out of New York. Oh, 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 New York. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Vinny's from New York. All right, the next question. All right, hey, man. my name is not Kenny. It's Ken N Y. Oh. 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 Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> we have somebody here who's in the film business, so I, I yeah. greatly oh, value the answer I'm getting here from Reggie Miller. Well, I'm sure this is going to be someone on my left side's movie. Remember the Titans. Yeah. Denzel Washington. Oh. I just think, you know, the social conflict. I'm dodging bullets over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody, no, nobody's going to take driving Miss Daisy. Don't worry. About <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Go ahead. Mine is life. With, with uh, Thanks. Eddie Murphy. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was ah! Oh, no, no, no. oh I, got, I got another. Okay. The gun line, boss. Oh, yeah. But that's the gun line. You know that one. You better start talking, boy. You're going to make me fall off them bottles, boy. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> and I, I, I like I can't be no more inventive. That's my favorite. That's, that's Don't cross the gun line, boss. Don't cross the gun line. State line, of Mississippi. Boss. Yeah, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Like, you know that one, Chuck? You seen I that? I do. Okay, Charles. Boss, I can't believe he don't like us. Yeah. Boss, wants to get away from us. Charles, nobody is taking your movie. My movie's great. All y'all picked out great movies, but. Braveheart. Yep. Braveheart is my favorite movie. I watched it every single... I watched it about three days ago. Anytime I'm going through all those channels, I see Braveheart. Now, this is pretty crazy, Mel Gibson, I might add. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> not not the Mel Gibson now, but I, that's my favorite movie of all time. What about yours? Go on. Go on. Go on. I'm, I'm you know, a big fan of No Country for Old Men. I like that. Mm -hmm. Big A big I'll fan of The Untouchables. Party. No, you only get one. You only, you only get, get one. one. <laughs> I know, but I'm. Uh, last time I checked, I'm looking at hearing 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. I'll just fill it up with as many movies as I what can. What about Kazam? That's <laughs> open. Kazam! 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 Why did I say that? I should You know, they said Kazam was so bad, they didn't even put that on DVD. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was trying to think of a movie that had a cheese scene. <laughs> hey, uh, that was, that was funny. Ratatouille. Uh, yeah. Anyway, y'all. Yeah, yeah.